the Lion of Judah who conquered the grave. It's to him that we turn our attention this morning as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. Please begin turning in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, there will be some men coming, making their ways down the aisles. And if you put your hand up, they would be glad to put a Bible in your hand. So you can follow along with us this morning as we read from God's Word. And as we're turning to 1 Peter 5, it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus Christ left instructions for Christ, um, for followers of Christ in the church, so that we would remember his sacrificial death on the cross until he comes again, until he returns again to this world in glory, which we just sang about. And his future return, of course, is only possible because he did not remain in the grave but ascended to the right hand of the Father who intercedes for us and will one day come again for his church. And in partaking of this meal today, individual followers of Christ, we proclaim our union with Christ in his death and his resurrection, as well as our union with one another, fellow members of the body of Christ. And this is a special time for believers of Jesus Christ. And so as the trays are passed in front of you, if this is not you. If you have not placed your faith in Christ alone for salvation, we would just ask that you would allow the, the trays to pass in front of you. Uh, we don't want to embarrass you. And actually, actually, we actually long for the day when you can partake of this same meal with us. And we would love to see you um, put your faith in Christ. And we would love for you to not leave today until you've talked to somebody about what it means to hope in Christ well, at the end of the service, we'll give you some instructions about where you might find somebody that would love to talk to you. But the rest of my comments this morning are really aimed at those who would identify as followers of Jesus Christ. And so as we make our way to 1 Peter 5, Peter is writing to those who are believers in Christ, those scattered Christians who were chosen by God, set apart by God through his spirit to follow Christ by grace. Believers in Christ were born again through his grace and mercy so that the result would be that we would be obedient from the heart to the truth. Peter says in chapter 1 that in their obedience, that is their submission of their lives to Jesus Christ and the gospel, that their souls were purified or cleansed so they might love one another from the heart. And this is a radical transformation it was made possible not because they cleaned up their lives, not because they mustered up their own strength and their own flesh, the strength to change their thoughts and their affections and their very nature. They couldn't, and we can't do that, and nor could we ever hope to pay the price that our sin against an, a holy and eternal God demands. There's only one way that sin could be ever paid for. And Peter reminds him in chapter 2 that Jesus Christ, who never sinned, bore our sins that all who would believe in him in his body on the cross when he suffered unjustly for our sins, as he quotes Isaiah 53, that they might be healed and live for righteousness. And this is saving grace. Christ was treated as if he lived our lives, that we might be treated as if we lived his life and might actually reap eternal reward because of it. That's grace. And that's what we remember today when we take communion. So Peter has been writing to these believers in Jesus Christ who are suffering under various forms of persecution and hostility to the gospel. And let's read chapter 5, verse 8. Chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Peter, in bringing his letter to a conclusion, commands believers in a hostile world, in a world hostile to the gospel, to be sober, to be watchful, to be alert. And this isn't the first time in his letter that Peter has used this language. Uh, he, as part of his first command in the book, he says, Therefore, having girded your minds for actions, being sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace 
to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so now, again at the conclusion of his book, Peter again calls his readers to sober-mindedness, to be alert, to be ready. And in chapter 1, he told them, be alert, looking for the coming of Christ. Now he tells us to be alert and tells us what we need to be alert for and against. The one who is, he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So be alert, be sober. The one who is asleep or drunk is blind in regard to the realities of sin in the world and in ourselves. They're not watchful for the allure of temptation the attacks, and they make themselves easy prey. And temptation works like that. It works, it actually works at the heart level, the desire level inside of us. Temptations might come from outside of us, but don't, those temptations don't put the desire inside of us. Those desires are already there in our hearts, and sin seeks to, Satan seeks to awaken, expose, and appeal to those sinful desires that already reside in the heart. But in verse 8, we we see that Satan is actively looking to pounce upon the unsuspecting believer. He is an architect, the architect of hostility towards God, hostility towards the gospel. His plans from the beginning were to erode confidence in God's word, to reject God's word. And Satan would love to use pressure upon believers in persecution and in trials to appeal to the desires within each one of us to tempt us to want to exact revenge, to tempt us when mistreated to assert our own will, to tempt us to seek after our own best interests. Believer, God has promised us an incorruptible imperishable, unfading inheritance in Christ. Christ is coming again. We take the bread and the cup and we proclaim that till he comes and when he comes, we will have our inheritance. Uh, This life is hard and we are surrounded by those who are opposed to the gospel. This life is full of difficulties and our own sin even compounds that. And there are times when we're gonna encounter really difficult circumstances and the promises of God don't feel like the reality that we see in front of us. God may seem far off. We're tempted to doubt his goodness when those are people mistreat us, when we suffer. When God seems far off and we're tempted to doubt his goodness, have you felt like this at times? And it's at that time that we are most vulnerable to Satan's attacks. He would love to use the empty promise of momentary relief, that flicker of doubt in your heart to turn you away from God. So be alert, be watchful. Men, I'm gonna actually ask you to come forward right now and pass out the communion elements. And as they do, believers, Peter is, as he writes, he's not done, he's, he is confident that there is hope no matter our circumstances, unlike God's, unlike God, Satan's purposes can be thwarted. Listen as I read from verse 9. But resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished among your brothers who are in the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, strengthen, confirm, and ground you. To him be might forever and ever. Amen. Believer, how do we resist the one who would seek to do us harm in moments of weakness? Peter says, resist him. Firm in the faith. Believer, cling to faith. Cling to what you know to be true. Entrust yourself to God's promises. Suffering and hostility are common in this world. 
And they're common for believers. There are no reason to doubt God's promises. There are actually more reason to trust God's promises because he told us they would come. Today, as you prepare your heart for communion, take a few moments to confess before the Lord, where has your faith wavered? Where have you believed the lies that sin has offered? What pleasures, what momentary relief from life's trials have you sought after that's caused you to doubt God's faithfulness and his promises? And confess those to the Lord and and take communion with us this morning. God who is merciful and loves to forgive sin when a believer confesses it. And when your heart is prepared, I'll have you go ahead and take the cup and the bread on your own this morning. And when you do so, remember Jesus Christ who bore our sins on the cross so that our sins would be forgiven, that we would be set free from slavery to sin, and that we would one day be with him in that perishable inheritance. And then when everyone looks to be finished, then I'll go ahead and close our time.